Um, so welcome everyone to the second lecture of the fourth and last module um, on data processing and analysis tools. Uh, like all of the previous weeks, please post your questions in the chat during the lecture. Uh, we will collate them and ask questions after the lecture. Um, I'm seeing a chat message that um, someone can't hear me. Is that a problem generally or people can hear me? I can hear you. Okay. I'm right. just one person. Okay. I'm going to, uh, oh, there we go. Lillian says that she, okay. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. So if you can't hear, oh. it's always worth trying to log off and log in again. And exactly. It might be or if you don't see slides or don't have audio, please try leaving and joining again. Okay. Perfect. Thank you everyone for confirming it. You can hear me. Um, so I repeat, please put your questions in the chat um, and we will collate them and ask them after the lecture. Um, and also I'd like to remind you that um, all of the lectures are recorded. Um, they're on our YouTube channel. You can subscribe to our channel and the lectures appear maybe one or two weeks after, um, after they've been given. Um, um, it's my pleasure today uh, to introduce uh, Dr. Gail Forget. Um, he works as a research scientist at uh, MIT in the USA, where he investigates oceanography and climate. Uh, Gail completed his PhD at uh, the University, University of Bretagne uh, in France, uh, um, where he demonstrated the value of Argo data uh, in the context of ocean state estimation and climate variability monitoring. He joined MIT in 2005 as a postdoc, and he has been a research scientist in the Department of Earth, Atmospheric and Planetary Sciences since 2008. His work at MIT focuses on ocean modeling and the analysis of global ocean data sets, uh, such as the Argo profile collections, uh, satellite records of sea level and ocean color retrievals. Uh, Gail Go develops computer programs in various languages and carries out ocean state estimation, estimations using the MIT general circulation model in order to interpolate and, and interpret ocean observations. His scientific interests include ocean circulation and climate variability, tracer transfer, uh, transport and turbulent transformation processes, interaction of ecological, geochemical and physical processes, global cycles of heat, water and carbon, observational statistics and forward and inverse modeling. Um, Gail is also a Julia enthusiast, and today he will be speaking about how to use Julia for Earth observation. Um, Gail, the floor is yours. All right. Um, so, hello, everybody. I, can you confirm you hear me well? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. So, I'll start with uh, opening my slides. Uh, oh, sharing my screen first of all. There you go. Oh, and. Uh, should be able to start my slides. There we go. I can close this and off we go. Um, all right. So hi, everyone. Um, so uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm going to uh, give you an introduction to uh, what uh, you can do with the Julia language in the context of, of uh, processing and analyzing um, ocean color data and Earth observations more generally. In the presentation, I will uh, oops, slides. Oh, this is... um, the presentation will proceed in in four um, sections, uh, mostly three. Um, the first one, I will just introduce uh, the Julia language uh, briefly for those who might not be familiar with it, um, and sort of the notebooks and and environments that we will use. Um, then I will talk about ocean color data more specifically. And in the third section, I will sort of broaden the scope a little bit uh, to Earth observation more generally. Each of the section will have notebooks uh, that will be linked uh, into the uh, presentation. And I will demonstrate them on the screen. You will be able to use them afterwards, um, hopefully. And so I will try and take breaks uh, for you to write down a question or two after each section as well. So let's jump in. Uh, so Julia is a 
programming language that by um, most people's standards is fairly new. Um, the initial release uh, was in 2012. Um, and for context, the initial release of Python was 1992, I believe. So it's 20 years younger. Um, and importantly, um, the release of version 1.0 of, uh, of Julia, which means stability um, and continuity happened in 2018. And so since then, uh, the language has really kind of exploded in its use. Uh, this is an open source uh, language by um, very high standards, um, in fact. It's general purpose and it has a very modern design, partly because it's, it's recent. Um, so it's benefited from lessons learned through uh, the development of previous languages. And in fact, it is um, one of its strengths is that it interacts very well with uh, say Python and Jupyter and things like that. Um, so once you're familiar with this, you know, you come into Julia and it's, it's not a huge uh, learning curve. And you can reuse your codes from other languages as well. Um, there is a rich uh, ecosystem of packages that support different functionalities, like simple ones like plotting and you know reading files and data, uh, which I will tell you about today. Uh, but also simulation and and real like uh, high performance calculation supports GPUs uh, stuff like that. And all of this relies on. Um, a wide developer community that is distributed across the globe with a lot of people in Europe, in uh, the US, um, as well as in uh, a lot of other places in the world. And those academics, but not just academics, they are uh, real software people um, that develop some of the contents as well. Um, and so one of the things I would highlight uh, is that in a sense, uh, Julia was designed to solve this so-called two-language problem, um, which you might have experienced if you do scientific calculation. That is, you want something like Python or MATLAB to kind of prototype quickly and demonstrate and share with, with colleagues. Um, so kind of a high-level um, view into your science. But you also need, often when you are doing big computations, uh, of a compiled language, like something like Fortran or C++ that goes very fast. And so Julia achieved both at the same time, which means that ultimately, if you wanted to use just Julia, um, you can do that and achieve both the performance and the, and the high level um, interaction with the language. So this will come clear hopefully with, uh, with looking at some notebooks and some examples. But I would say, you know, to me, in my opinion, um, Julia is a really good fit for this kind of community um, interested in scientific computation and, and communication. And another reason I use it is it's actually fun and, and very efficient uh, developing in Julia. Um, so I've migrated myself from a lot of Fortran and MATLAB in the past. Um, and at this point, I'm really focused on Julia because it's, it's, um, it's very rewarding, I find. Uh, these are my opinions, but here is a couple of links that you can visit uh, where you will see uh, a more representative um, set of experiences uh, in this first link. This was a blog post where a lot of people contributed um, their own little blurb uh, explaining why they used Julia at this stage in 2022. And then the original motivation be behind Julia is, uh, is well explained into this uh, famous blog post from 2012 that was the initial release. So I'll let you read that at your own convenience and moving on. Here is the Julia website. Um, so we're going to go there uh, right away. Um, the QR code should point you to the same website that I'm going to click the link from. And here we are. Um, so this is the main web page where you will go to download and 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 learn about Julia. Uh, so the download, for example, is a very simple operation depending on your machine. You just click on the right link and and off you go. Uh, the documentation is extensive. I'm not going to walk you through all of that. Um, I'll highlight the forty plus uh, thousand. Uh, stars on GitHub that the language has received, which is you know, an illustration of how popular it is. These are some of the same 
uh, aspects that I've mentioned before, uh, listed here, uh, highlighted. Uh, but I just wanted to show you this one. Um, so here, this link will let you try Julia in your web browser uh, without installing anything. And so you end up with a page like this and you click the arrow. And this is a very simple way for you to, um, to try out um, you know, very basic Julia things. Um, so nothing particular here, I'm going to move on from this, uh, but this is a, an, an easy way to get, get going if you want to try it out. Uh, there's a bunch more uh, explanations in this page, uh, a lot of very useful resources, but I'm not going to go through any of that. Uh, the most important thing is this is where you get Julia, and this is the central web page. Go back to my presentation. So we're going to look in a minute at a notebook that was designed to get people up to speed with some of the language the Julia language um, basic features. Uh, this was contributed by Lazaro uh, in the context of this Julia for Earth Observation uh, workshop that we have organized in January, and I will come back to this later. Um, again, the QR code should send you to the um, adequate uh, notebook. And on the left, you have the view that you will get of the notebook this is a Jupyter notebook from within a Jupyter lab instance. Uh, this is a computational environment that is quite friendly and common. You will come back to this um, in other sessions. Uh, for example, Python uses the same. And I'm going to show you uh, more of this in a second, but I'll make a slight detour um, to tell you about this web page. Uh, so this is a web page that has a, a list of the notebooks uh, that we're going to be using today. And it also provides um, the environment that I just showed you in a, in a portable fashion, something that you can use yourself. So I'm going to just go to this web page. This is from the Julia Clement organization on GitHub. And you will see that there's a menu that tells you about notebooks of different things. What I want to show you today is just the directions, uh, which have to do with how you get back to us with questions after this seminar, or how you run notebooks uh, in various ways. So if you have your own sort of installation of Julia, then you can follow this step-by-step. Step. This is to start a Pluto notebook framework. Here is a common line version of that, but what I wanted to get to is really this. Um, so this is how you're going to run with the so-called Docker uh, program on your own machine, the very same environment that I'm going to be using today. And it is available in the cloud uh, with this free binder link. Uh, so I'm going to click on that to show you. Uh, so you can try the notebooks here the ones that I'm going to show you today. The caveat is that this is a little slow and a little, it's not a very big computer, so it will run out of memory uh, rather fast. So I'm not going to be using this one specifically. I'm going to let it proceed and hopefully it will start to show you what it should look like, but at the end you should have something that looks like this. Just double check, is it running? Okay. So this version here is on my laptop. But it's the same environment, and that's the beauty of this, in a way, is that we can have the same environment in the cloud on our own machine, and, and you can install it with Docker. In any event, you can also run the notebooks natively once you have installed Jupyter on your machine on, and Julia. Um, so you don't need this, but it's an option that might be useful for you. So the interface, as you see here, has a bunch of buttons. And if you just click on this Julia 1.9.1, you will start a notebook, a Jupyter notebook in this case, that will show you that you can just start using Julia. So if you again do just one plus one to check that this is just running, you can then start doing more Julia things. And the first thing I'm going to show here, or really the only one, is the package manager. Which we're going to call this way. So this is 
um, how you import the package manager itself, which is called package G. And then you can start looking at what is on your machine. In this case, this little container that I'm using through my lab. So here you're seeing that this has a few different packages with versions and so on. Um, and this is just an illustration of Julia working with package. So rather than looking more at this one, I will go to this notebook. This is the one that I was mentioning in my slide, the beginner's notebook. Um, it has a lot of topics covered, uh, which are summarized here. So it tells you about the syntax of the language, data structures, uh, package uh, the package manager, which I've already tell you, told you about. Um, and then um, things about tabular data and variational variable transformations. So we're not going to cover all of this and we don't have the time for it, uh, but I'm going to give you a hint of a couple of things. Um, so the native data structures, if I go further down, bear with me one second, I need to find it. This is already started, sorry. All right. All right, native data structures. So these are data structures that are natively supported by the language. And the reason I wanted to highlight this part is there's a lot of things there that you're familiar with. Uh, for example, this first one here is a string, right? And so you define a string in Julia by just putting these double quotes and then text in between. If I add an extra, um, cell here, I can, you know, use it again and I can do what's done here, which is to show you the type of it, things like that. And you can also index into a string. So if you do this, which is the indexing with square brackets, uh, that's how it's done in, in Julia and it starts from one, not from zero, like in other languages sometimes, then you get, you know, a character. So these are strings, uh, tuples are sort of list of sorts, name tuples um, are a particularly convenient version of that. Um, here you have a lot of different explanation in this notebook. So you, you will learn in detail how to use strings, tuples, which are kind of a list, like I said, so this is a tuple, so on and so forth. Um, an array, maybe if I'm going to go to look at the array type, and um, starts here. Um, so an array or a vector is the same, except that an array is typically a multidimensional vector. And you can define them in different ways. So here is one way that you can define it. And so if I change this, it's going to make my vector longer. Uh, similarly here, we can define it by putting values. Um, and, and so a lot of very simple things, basically sort of standard syntax that you will find in all languages. You can define arrays with predefined values like this, uh, zeros, um, and change the size here, so on and so forth. So a lot of things that if you have used any other language before, uh, you should be familiar with. And one more topic briefly before I move on, um, there is a very good support for more advanced types. Uh, one of them, for example, is um, what's called data frames. In Python, which you will hear about later, this would be pandas. So this is how you handle lists and tabular data. Um, it then lets you read CSV files. And, and so, for example, here is a common where you just read a CSV file to get a nice formatted column in the data frame format. And that then allows you to do a lot of things like look at columns with this nice syntax. So this is the table, so on and so forth. So this is, there's a large um, suite of tools and functionalities that relate to um, tables and, and tabular data, uh, which is uh, a strength of the language. It's very well developed. So I think this was all that I was going to highlight from this um, notebook. Um, so I've told you about this, and I've told you about the beginner's notebook. Um, 
So before I jump into the next section, I will take a little one minute break um, to give you time to write questions that you might not have written yet. All right, I see a lot of great questions on my screen. We'll, we'll get to them at the end, I believe. Um, so with this, I'm going to move on to the next part. Uh, we're going to talk about Ocean Coder um, and how to use it uh, in Julia. Specifically, I'm going to show you two notebooks. Uh, one will be on deriving chlorophyll from reflectance variables, um, a topic that, you have, that has been covered uh, from the theory side in a pre previous lectures. Um, and then the second notebook in this part will deal with uh, the classification of ocean color data. Uh, also a topic that uh, you should be familiar with at this stage. We are going to be using the ocean color data.gl package, which is uh, somewhat depicted here on the left. It contains a, it's a small package that contains um, the functions that uh, implement what we are going to be talking about. For example, the last one converts from remotely sensed reflectances to uh, chlorophyll A. It's part of a Julia Ocean organization that you will find on GitHub. The link is at the bottom of this page. And what you see on the right hand side is a list of some of the packages that are um, in this organization. So you see that ocean color data is there. Uh, Avro data, in fact, I have moved to a different organization, uh, but there is Avro data, as the name indicates, and other things that might look uh, rather relevant to this, like the two at the top, uh, to this to the topic we're talking about today, uh, but from the modeling side. So two different kind of models for um, mine biogeochemical cycles. That's the first one, IBEX gel. And plankton individual gel is a agent-based model that represents phytoplankton populations. I am not going to touch on those today. We're going to focus on ocean color data. The first notebook uh, for this part is this one. Uh, you have a snapshot of some of the text on the left and a, a QR code uh, that will lead you to the um, to a rendering of this notebook online. It is found in the Marine Ecosystem Notebooks folders and um, repository, as it, it is called, within Julia Ocean. And we're going to jump right into it. So this is the one we're doing before. So we're going to switch to this notebook now. So this notebook, um, as before, uh, is running in Julia. Uh, this is again a Jupyter notebook. This first line here is an important one, so I'm going to explain. Um, you will find something like this in pretty much every Julia notebook. This is a line that says we're going to use a certain number of packages. And so before I've shown you the import uh, approach, using is kind of similar. Um, it's slightly more common. Um, so here we are using the ocean color data GL package. And then we're going to use the plots package, for example, to make uh, graphs from uh, our results. This notebook is um, looking at ocean color data from the perspective of comparing it with models and comparing it with uh, variables um, that reflect the amount of irradiance coming back from the sea surface, um, but that's the sun irradiance. So it's a, 
it's a slightly different variable than the one observed. So we'll need to go and to a couple of steps of, of conversions to get to from this set of variables, which are called irradiance reflectances. And they're going to be defined on a certain set of wavelength, 13 of them here. We're going to convert those to remotely sensed reflectances, which you've heard of in previous lectures, um, that are on these wave bands. So this means we're going to do, as you proceed through the notebook, you're going to do, to do an interpolation, a conversion, which is this formula here, to go from the irradiance reflectances to the remotely sensed reflectances. And then interpolate in wavelength space, space. Um, and here, what I'm showing you now is sort of the verification of the result. So the fact is we have this red curve that is, um, I think in the horizontal axis is just the, um, the wavelength. Uh, so we already indicated that, sorry for this. Um, in the vertical axis, you are going to have the LRS. Um, that's the reference we got from our colleagues at PML. And then this is the result that you get in green with the function that's provided by the ocean coordinate GL package. So all of this to say, um, this is working. We can use the package to do this. The next part of this notebook is going to be now the set of formulas that get you from the remotely sensed reflectance to chlorophyll, which is defined as a ratio, as you know, um, between the bio ratio between the blue and green um, values of reflectance. There are several different algorithms um, that have been proposed to do the conversion beyond that point, which involves this polynomial here. Uh, so this gives me a quick opportunity to walk you through an important feature of Julia, which is how you operate function element-wise. Here you have a vector, if I show you this, should be a vector. It's in fact just one value. And then this one is also just one value, but they are in fact vectors. So this operation is going to take the log of the ratio of those two values. And the dot here means that we're going to do operation element-wise, which is practical. And more clearly, we're going to see it here, where this is going to take, um, well, we're going to see the same thing here. So we put the dot basically so that we can operate the operation, so exponential here in this case, on every element, even if there is only one. By the end of this, we have chlorophyll A. So through the change of variables and then the sequence of recipes, we derive chlorophyll. At this point, the notebook continues to tell you about uh, classifiers, but we're going to do this in a separate notebook um, that is a slightly more visual. So this one here, is going to take remotely sensed reflectances as an input. In fact, we're going to get it directly from um, the OCCCI uh, data set. We're going to have it on six wavelength, and then we're going to apply a couple more operations to that, to create the classifier or to apply the classifier. As before, we have a set of notebooks that are being used. So the first two you recognize, ocean color data and plots uh, for visualizing. The new one is NC data sets. And so that is how the piece of package with which you're going to be able to open and manipulate NetCDF data sets, which is a very common file format that you will 
have heard about in previous sessions and you'll hear about it again in, in the coming ones. So every language as programming language has ways to deal with these files, read them, write them, etc. ncdatasets.jl is one of the Julia packages that does this for us. We're going to see how it is used. The, opti the optical classification um, in our case is going to be one that uh, was defined by Moore originally and that has been was extended later on by Tom Jackson and, and colleagues, um, some of you here. It proceeds with a vector and a matrix that we read from files. So at this point, we have um, our classifier ready to be applied and we're going to read in data sets to apply. So this is the illustration of opening a NetCDF file and using it. This little NetCDF file contains um, a bunch of variables. The command that you see here, here uh, opens the file and creates a data structure DS, which is a lazy representation of what's in the file. So just the metadata, that's what lazy means at this, in this context. So if I use the next cell to show you, this is what the data structure looks like. Um, so once you just open the file this way, you are able to see what's in it. Um, and you see, for example, that this um, surface reflectance is at a certain wavelength and that it is stored in an array with certain dimensions indicated here, it has units and so on. Uh, so you have access to all of those things immediately as soon as you open the file, but opening the file itself is very fast because you're actually not reading any, any of the data itself. The next lines in this, um, in this cell here are going to start accessing variables. But the first step is also lazy. So that is, if I show you this data structure now, it's also just metadata. So now we're accessing the variable called RRS, that underscore 412 um, in the file, but we are just for now retrieving the metadata. So again, you get all of the information, but the data has not been accessed yet. To access the data is with this syntax. Now is when you're actually retrieving all of this data to memory and you recognize the size of the array that was announced by looking at the metadata. And a lot of the values here are missing, but you start seeing you know, numerical values um, that are the observations. So by this point, we have all of our variables in this kind of lazy format, lazy form, and then we can proceed on using it. Um, so as I said, we're going to here extract one array from the file and we're going to plot it. Uh, so here I wanted to show you the use of the plots package uh, to produce a heat map. Uh, so very simple, you provide the three variables in the title and here you go. If we keep going in this notebook is where things become slightly more interesting in a way. Um, we are going to see this first little code block is just going to be to select the variable points that are not missing. And then this is the application of the classifier in the second block here. Um, so a couple of things to know. One is this is a loop, standard way of writing loops. You have other methods to do this, um, but this is the simplest way to write a loop, should feel familiar. And then here we're getting an index. We're then going to get form a vector of values that we're going to provide to this fuzzy classification function with the pieces we read from the file uh, that defines the classifier before. And so at the end of this loop, we now have a map of the membership for each of the of the classes we, we can plot plot and so again we're just now getting the right variable in the right format for plotting 
and then you can just depict that. Um, so very simple, should feel familiar. Um, and that was the end of what I wanted to say with this notebook. So let me go back to the presentation. Let's see. So we've gone through the, um, I saw a question about the link. There will be the link to the, um, the presentation at the very end of, of the presentation. Um, this was the notebook, two notebooks, one that derived chlorophyll from reflectances, another one that they have uh, classes, uh, class classification from uh, the same kind of data. And that concludes the, this part. So again, I will take a little break uh, to give you a minute to write down questions you might have. All right. Um, so let's let's move on to the next part of the presentation, the last main part. Now I'm going to tell you about um, this workshop that happened in January, where we brought together a, lot, a, a big part of the community that develops Julia tools for Earth observation, broadly speaking. We're going to look at two notebooks. Uh, one has to do with um, different kind of data sets that people use and combine um, that are the kind of array types, which here we're going to call rasters, and polygons, which they use regions. So we're going to do this. And then in the next, um, the last notebook, we will look at um, another classification problem where we're going to use um, a random forest uh, toolbox, something that you might be familiar with as well. So Julia AO was a first of its kind uh, workshop where we brought together, as I said, um, a lot of the developers of packages that have to do with file formats, and, you know, applications, graphics, uh, AI, that kind of collectively um, are useful for understanding and interpreting Earth observations, um, as well as models, in fact. And so here I'm going to, I'm not going to tell you everything that's happened in this uh, one week um, event, but there was a lot of notebooks that you will be able to access there and that will give you um, potentially a lot of useful examples for different tasks and different goals. And I'm just going to take a few examples. Um, I will click on the web page just to show you this. Again, the QR code should lead you to the same web page I'm about to show you on the screen. And so um, what you will find here is a lot of useful information about you know, the, the contributors um, that participated in, in this event. Um, I'm not going to go through everybody's um, bio, but you know we were about 20. The program um, involved five days of lectures and hands-on session. Um, I'm just going to go to show you briefly. Um, you see the names of the contributors. Um, and then you can you know you can refer back to this page later. Um, so I'm just going to show you the breadth of what's there. Uh, by scrolling to the, to the page. I go back to the top. You have a few other things. Um, so this is the GitHub repository. There's also a place where you will find data sets we used, and then an explanation on how to use Docker, which I mentioned at the beginning uh, with, with video um, of, of how to use that. 
the GitHub repository itself, um, this is what it looks like, um, and maybe the first GitHub repository that I show today. So this one is under the Air Center, uh, which was the lead um, partner and, and, and um, sponsor for this event. Um, and the notebooks, this looks like a little folder. Um, go in and you're going to find all of the notebooks for each of the sessions. Um, and I'm going to select a few of them today to show you examples. Um, and go back to, I guess, my presentations for just one minute. We're going to look at two cases, uh, two aspects. So one has to do with gridded data and polygons. Uh, so here is a first notebook example. Um, this one was using data from um, the um, CMEMS platform and the Earth data platform. So we just extracted for the sake of this notebook a little subset, which is the gridded fields you see here that show uh, the colors. Um, that show sea level anomaly in the colors, and then in the in the contours, um, that's where the polygon comes in. Um, you see the ocean topography, and so this notebook was just take this time series and generate a movie animation from it. Here is another way that you might have come across polygons and arrays. Um, here you see the so-called long health provinces. Um, so this is a shed file uh, originally um, that we just read in with a package and, and then display. Um, but you see that the colors you know, could be um, analogous to, to an array uh, and to a kind of a... So, they, you know, so we're going to go deeper into this topic. Um, not with this particular notebook, we're going to use this one, uh, which was contributed by the, the lead developer of this package, uh, Raster.js, um, and handles the same things, uh, this kind of complementarity of arrays and, and polygon data sets. Um, and we're going to look at how to convert one into another. So again, the link on the right side should give you the notebook itself. What I am going to do is I'm going to go back to my environment here. This is, for those who have missed at the beginning, this is kind of a standard a Jupyter Hub, a Jupyter Lab, um, in fact, instance that I'm using that you have available to, your, to you as well, and that can be used to run the notebooks. So we've looked at, so far, uh, notebooks like these, which are of the Jupyter uh, type. We're going to look at a slightly different framework now, which is here and is called Pluto. So to get back one step, here is the landing page that you get, that you get in the Jupyter Lab. If you click on this Pluto link, it opens this page, and I am going to be looking at this particular notebook. There are important differences between Jupyter and Pluto. Um, one of them is that here the codes are typically hidden by default. So these are actually code blocks, markdown cells that um, are rendered, or actual code block like this. Uh, they can be hidden or highlighted. Um, also, the order of the operation does not matter in the rendering of the notebook. Um, and it is finally a reactive framework, which is maybe the most important differences, difference, which means every time you click somewhere in the, in the notebook and you change something, everything else that depends on it will adjust. Moving on, going back to the uh, notebook at hand, this is going to be looking at RasterHDL, which as explained here, is a package that builds on a lot of other ones to handle different data sets. So it has in fact, as a dependency, uh, NC data sets that is for LTDF. It will have ArchGDAO, which is for other types of data sets. And all of this is going to be used by 
REST RGL as a, as, a, as a front end. You have an example of a data set here that's been loaded with this, um, loaded to memory with this package. And so these are, um, I think, uh, classes of vegetation uh, shown as a function of location in terms of some kind of concentration. We are not going to go through the whole notebook because it is long. You have you can click on the right hand side and, and you're going to get to the different sections. What I want to highlight is this part on the rasterization. So this is the sort of operations that you might be interested in doing if you're looking at satellite data. For example, get some kind of polygon defining the region, and then you may want to do statistics over uh, your graded data set just for that region. So you need to go between you know, arrays and, and polygons. So this is what's going to happen here. We're going to start with the shape file, which is defining the border of different countries. We're going to just read that into memory. This is what these first few cells are doing. And I'm just going to highlight this one here, uh, which is you provide the file name, then there is a package called shape file that is going to handle the reading of that file. And then we pass that to the data frame package. All of this is done in one common and gives you at the end a nice table where each of the polygons for all of the countries are in just one column. So they are very easy to access after that. These next comments are a little abstract, but what they do is they uh, select filter the table for just Indonesia. And so at the end of this, we have in, in this variable called Indonesia border, a polygon that represents that particular country. As you see here, plotting it is very simple uh, because there is a, a method that's been provided to do this uh, by the developers of the of probably the shape file package. Now we have the polygon, okay? We're going to do what's called rasterizing it, which means looking for an array where the inside of the polygon is going to be of one value and then the outside is going to be on the other value. This is very, very simple to do with um, the rest of the package. It comes down to one, co one command which is here, just say rasterize your polygon, and then you have a little bit of explanation to give um, as to the missing values. And there you go. Now you have this color map because you're plotting the result of this rasterization um, with a certain color map, and everything is either zero or one, um, and you get in yellow the blueprint the, the footprint of the of the polygon and so you can verify this by putting the polygon on top of the uh, array that was plotted uh, just before and um, now you have gone from polygon to raster which means array here is the kind of applications that you might want to uh, to do with this um, going just one step further here we're going to look at denmark sweden and norway um, same thing as before. We're going to get a data set that's going to be the climate of this um, of, the, um, of the world for certain variables. Um, so this is what's shown here. These are your uh, different variables. So there's minimum of temperature and maximum of temperature, I believe, and then precipitation and winds. Um, we're going to zoom in on one of them. Uh, here we are just looking at the minimum of temperature. And then there is this mass function, essentially where all of the magic happens. Now we are just providing the variables for the climate, the border of the country that we want. And in return, we are going to get a masked out version of that. So the plot as, as, um, as is obvious here doesn't always come out great. This is pretty much white, but the reason is that Denmark is a small country and we don't want to plot it just on the global map. So there's a function to take care of that, which is trim. 
So once you do trim, then you get to what you're looking for, which is the climate for all of those variables in the particular country that you're interested in. And so this happened, if you notice, with just a few comments and an illustration of how uh, the packages that you get will make your life very easy um, when they are well developed like this West Australia package. So now we are looking at Norway and then we're going to see Sweden. Um, so that's it for this notebook. I have one more um, and then we will go to questions. Um, this one is going to be using the same kind of data. Typically, um, images, uh, data that are in format like TIFF, uh, for example, we can take a bunch of images and ask the question, what kind of landscape is this? What kind of um, vegetation might it be? And so to do this, you want an algorithm that's going to take images and give you classifier, a membership for certain um, types of landscape. So this first example, which we won't go into in the details, uses WestersGL and then FluxGL, which is another package for neural networks. Um, and then it generates a classifier uh, based on a conventional neural network. Um, I will let you explore this one. I will spend more time with this one, um, which has similar goals, uh, similar kind of inputs, just uses something slightly different for the classification, and that is a random forest algorithm. So as per usual, you have the QR code 3D notebook on the left, and I'm going to, on the other hand, go to the live uh, notebook which I believe I have here open in Oops. I go back to here, I'm back to Pluto, the main page, and I'm going to choose this notebook. So in this notebook, I'm going to go a little quick, uh, again, as before, uh, to just give you the flavor of what's going on. And so one thing we haven't really um, what well, we have mentioned briefly is how you get data files into memory from this uh, so-called CSV format. Um, so we are going to look at reading these files. I'll show you the command to train the model and then some of the output. So again, very simple to read a file. That's one thing we really want to do often. So there has been a lot of you know, emphasis on, on, on doing that right here. Uh, this is a CSV file. So you just provide the name. And then this command is going to turn into a data frame. Boom. Now you have a nice array version of your data. So this gives us the training and the test data set. Uh, there's going to be a bit of formatting going on here and setting up some of the methods parameters. And then here we are, we're just going to create the classifier. This is um, from the um, decision tree package. And, oh, somebody can actually hear me. Um, hopefully everybody else can. Um, the, um, this is the one command that's going to build the classifier. And so then once you have this, uh, you can start looking at how well it performs. In this case, we have uh, six um, classes that we are trying to identify in the data set. And this is the training phase. So the verification that the algorithm works as expected is lies in the fact that this matrix is going to be diagonal, uh, which is called the confusion matrix. So we're counting, uh, the diagonal is basically everything that's been, that was properly counted, properly classified. Once we've gone through the uh, classification um, training, then that can be applied. And so now we proceed and we're going to read in data um, in the diff format, I believe. And then once we have this in memory, we can then just apply the classification. 
for some reason, my notebook did not do the plotting right here. So I need to figure that out later. But the end result is exactly what I was showing you on the notebook. I'm going back here. And so the end result of this is on the left, you have the input data, which is the raster of the, um, uh, the remotely sense um, uh, uh, reflectance, I believe, um, depicted in some way on the left. And then on the right is the classification that results. And so you see, for example, that very distinct uh, areas emerge, like this one on the left, which is the outflow of a river, which I believe corresponds to the class um, where there's a lot of sediments. So this is a quick overview of the type of methods that you can today use in Julia without um, much trouble. Uh, there's fairly mature um, software to do all of these things that you might have come across in your research. I'll just take a brief moment to let you write your last questions and then I'll wrap up. All right, um, so to summarize very simply, I'm going to just reuse this slide. Um, I've shown you a little bit of an introduction to this language called Julia and some examples that uh, demonstrate that it provides uh, within the broad um, ecosystem of Julia software, a lot of the functionalities that you may need uh, for analyzing and processing Earth's observation. Um, I've given you a set of notebooks that you will be able to reuse um, on your machine or in the cloud that looked at ocean color. This was the first set of notebooks and then Earth's observation more generally um, in the second set of notebooks. Um, at this point, I will close the presentation by just uh, showing you the link to the slides in case you have uh, you want to access them. Um, the slides will give you all of the other web links and information that I try to, um, to provide today. And on this note, I will thank you for our attention and um, I will welcome any question you might have. Um, thank you. Thank you, Gail. That was a wonderful presentation and I've learned a lot and um, it's really good to see what you can do with Julia. So I really enjoyed that. Um, we have a couple of questions, so I'm just going to try and ask them in order of your presentation um, and we'll go through them uh, one by one. Um, so one of the first questions is um, about how big uh, the community um, of ocean color is that is using Julia, and is it greater than uh, the community that uses Python? Um, yeah, it's a fair question. Um, I think it's a, it's a growing community. Uh, to be honest, I do not know how big the Python community is, uh, but I don't know general, either. I think in general, as a as a rule of thumb. Um, the Julia community for any particular subject is probably going to be a little um, smaller than the Python community, uh, simply based on the fact that Python has been there for so long. And it's also what is being taught in every university. In fact, you know, it's, it's a very good language, Python. You will hear more about it um, in the later, um, this, later sessions. And I would highlight also that um, these things play well with one another. Mm -hmm. uh, I wrote that on, on one of my slides, but you can, you know, you can reuse everything that's done in Python and Julia and vice versa. So in, in a way, you know, we're all one big community is the way I'd like to see it. Thank you for that answer. 
um, there are indeed a lot of questions related to um, why you would choose one language over the other. Are they in, can they integrate? Um, so people are asking questions about integration of Julia, Julia and Python or Julia and MATLAB. Um, so could you comment on that? Sure. Um, so in general, um, you know, today I would start by saying that we all use many different languages and sometimes we don't necessarily realize it because they do integrate well with one another. Mm -hmm. uh, so for example, you can pretty easily uh, call a Python API from Julia. I do that frequently. Um, I don't see the reason to redo them, you know, when they exist. Um, and so you can do the reverse as well. Um, so that's, you know, th that's the first aspect of it. Um, and then in terms of, you know, all of those languages, one thing that I particularly like is the Jupyter interface and, and environments because they provide the same platform and sort of user experience regardless of the language you use. So I think, um, you know, that's, that's why I, I, I focus on on Jupyter a little bit in the presentations like these is um, this is really a common thread which helps everybody. Um, so MATLAB is a bit of an outlier sometimes mm -hmm. <laughs> because they have a licensing model that uh, makes things complicated. Uh, but otherwise, you know, all of the free, um, really open um, languages like Python, Julia, R, um, you know, are are very well supported and, and very easy to use in, in the Jupyter context. Um, what should I say about this? Um, maybe maybe that's enough for now. Um, not sure. Thank you. I think that answers that question definitely. Okay, um, well, there was, I, oh, I, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I apologize. I was going to uh, mention one thing that I just forgot. Um, the um, in one of my slides, I, I highlighted, uh, let me just show you on the screen if I can uh, briefly. Um, just, I'm going to go back to presenter for just one second. Yeah, no problem. Um, right. So in this slide, if you follow this particular link here, the one that says why we use Julia 10 years later, that's going to send you to this page. And here you're going to have a lot of people talking about this, um, mm. sort of why they chose Julia, where they use it or where they're coming from. You will find in this list my own somewhere, uh, but there's mm. a lot more than just my own experience. And, you know, you will see a lot of people that have come to this language from Python or still use Python for some things. And maybe some come from other things like MATLAB. Um, and so I think, you know, you will find maybe the answers that you're looking for in, in going to these posts and they're all in this little format. Um, some of them are from these first people here, are very kind of current uh, Julia developers, but there are also going to be people that are much more new to it. Um, and so I think that's a, that's a good place to look to kind of find your own answer to that, to that question, essentially, of the choice of language, which, you know, as far as I'm concerned, there is no wrong choice. <laughs> if you choose something that's open source and you're trying to contribute your software to the world, uh, we can handle your language. Thank you. That's a really good answer. We've been trying to encourage all participants to sort of look further and study things by themselves. Uh, so I think that is a really good resource and people get, get inspired by other people using Julia. Yeah. Um, there's um, a question related to this, and maybe you already touched upon this. Um, so someone wanted to know how they could integrate Python with MATLAB um, and Julia. Um, will that work? Because you mentioned MATLAB is a licensed software, uh, so there might be restrictions on that. Yeah, so uh, for example, to use Python, um, within Julia, there's a couple of packages that you will want to look at. Mm -hmm. One is called PyCallJL, PyCall.jl, and that is to um, call a, a Python uh, library, kind of the same way you would normally do it. 
Um, so instead of, you know, in a, in a Python environment, you do import and the name of your, um, so import X array or import something. Um, here you're going to do pi import and the name. So it's very similar. And then you're going to use it the same way you used to um, from Julia. So it's kind of that simple. Mm -hmm. um, another package like this that you will probably want to learn about is conda.jl. Uh, so this is um, an interface to the conda environment that a lot of Python folks will, will know about. Um, so it lets you install uh, packages, um, Python libraries, as they're called. Um, from within Julia again, and install them either in your own kind of Python environment, or in fact, Julia within itself has a little instance of Conda, uh, so you can install it internally. So that's for using in that direction. I believe there is something called Julia Pi uh, on the Python side to do the reverse, which is to call Julia software from within Python. MATLAB, um, MATLAB, I haven't really tried, so I'm not entirely <laughs> sure. I should know by now, but I haven't um, really tried to use it that way. I believe there is the equivalent of PyCo. Mm -hmm. um, if you are calling MATLAB per se, you will need a license as usual. Um, but there is also the possibility to use uh, GNU Octave. Uh, which is free software and, in fact, is very, um, very good software, in my opinion, with, you know, a package management and all of that built in. Uh, it's really improved over the, the past decade, I would say, compared to some of the experiences you might have had with Octave way back when. Um, so I think if you're, if you're looking to do MATLAB open source software development, First of all, you know, put your software on GitHub, make it nice, documented, and easy to use. Um, and you know, for me, that's that's plenty good. Um, and then you know, trade out on Octave because that means that then your software will be usable um, by anybody who might not be able to afford the MATLAB license. Um, with this being said, you know, I used to be uh, uh, MATLAB used to be my my main go to programming language for anything to do with analysis and implementation. And since I moved to Julia, I basically stopped using it completely. Um, yeah. So that says two things. Uh, one is I'm motivated, but also that there is not much in MATLAB that I'm missing uh, that's not already in Julia. Um, so it's also a very easy bridge. And that's one thing I didn't really say. Uh, one of the reasons I did a jump from MATLAB to Python was for me, this was a huge jump because I had a lot of software that was in MATLAB that was going to be hard to reuse in Python. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas in terms of the syntax, Julia is much closer to MATLAB as you might have already realized by looking at the code I showed you today. Um, and so there's the way I tend to describe it is to convert the MATLAB code into a Julia code Basically, you take that and you replace the round brackets with square brackets for the indexing, and that's it. And half of the time, this will actually work. Um, so you can fairly easily transfer your MATLAB code or Octave code into Julia. Um, hopefully, that, that helps. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think it's a good answer. So there are ways to combine the different languages. Uh, but it might also not be too difficult to go from one to the other. Um, and clearly you have done that um, as well. Um, there was a practical question about installing Julia on Windows um, and whether it would be better to uh, install, um, let's see, a portable, portable installation. I see. Um... So if you go to the Julia website, um, like I was um, showing you earlier, so julialang.org, um, under download, you will find executables uh, for Windows. And so I have not done this myself because I do not have a Windows equipped machine available to me, uh, but I am very convinced that it is as simple 
to use on Windows as it is on everything else. Uh, that is, you're going to have a, a build for that environment, and you're going to click on the button, and it's going to get to a machine, and, and off you go. Um, so I, I would say it's not an obstacle. Um, okay. So the, and you mentioned there are resources on the Julia website that should be able to help uh, people with that. Okay. Yeah, I can show it on the screen if you want. Um, yeah, if you, we, I think we have time. So yeah, if you can. It will be brief. I'm just going to yeah. get back to screen share and uh, here, right? So this is the Julia Lang dot org website and if you go to download um, this is what i was saying you're going to have the installer for windows um, maybe that is the portable um, uh, version that was referred to in the question i actually do not know about this um, the difference between the two and then you have you know mac os um, with the different kind of processors you have different versions for linux and so on and in each case you know, you just download the file and um, and you unpack it and the rest will kind of happen magically. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, right, another question about Julia. Um, how do you do debugging in Julia? And someone mentions they do this line by line in MATLAB and would it be similar or are there different methods? So there are different methods. Um, there is a, um, I mean, let's start with what I do. I, I mean, I tend to do it rather simply, um, kind of line by line, um, you know, in notebooks is a good way to go. Um, I like Pluto notebooks in particular, uh, because they have this reactivity feature to them. That means everything in one that I change in one grid cell might have an impact on everything else and it will update immediately. And so when you when you tap something faulty, it breaks your notebook and it's very obvious. Mm. Right. So it's a simple way of, you know, if there's a typo anywhere, it will break the notebook. And so it's a simple way to go about this. Uh, you can use um Jupyter on the same way, kind of line by line and, and make sure that um checking your results. Um, there are also various different tools for introspection uh, and for debugging. So there's a couple of debuggers. Uh, I, I, um, I'm not remembering on top of my head uh, what they are called, but I think they are one called rebugger.jl. Um, and within the various uh, ADEs, um, so for example, in VS Code, there is kind of native support for this. So the same way that you would have in the MATLAB graphical user interface, you would have a way to click and put, you know, breakpoints and things like that. Uh, the same exists for Julia, um, typically through VS Code, which is the Microsoft kind of graphical user interface for multiple languages, uh, which is also an editor. Um, and you can also, so outside of this, I have not really shown you the terminal window uh, approach to using Julia, uh, but you can also use the debugger in that format. Um, and um, yeah, one one place to look for this type of information is um, um, on the JuliaCon uh, YouTube uh, website. So these are topics that come come back kind of regularly, and and the novelties are developed are presented every year. Um, in fact, Julia Kern is happening this year at the end of this month in Boston. So you get, you know, if you want to get deep into Julia, that's a good place to listen to and, and learn about new things. And there are uh, several sessions that I can I think I remember talking about debuggers. Um, in that in that framework like the past few years. I just don't have them on top of my head. Thank you. I think you've given enough information for participants to to go and explore and find out how to use different debuggers for Julia. But there are definitely options out there. Um, so um, we had a question on how to open NetCDF files um, in Julia, but you actually demonstrated that um, after the question was posted. 
Um, so I'm hoping that Marta now has an answer on that um, and she can always rewatch uh, your lecture um, to find, uh, find those details again. Um, we're going to move on to questions about uh, some of the notebooks you showed on uh, deriving chlorophyll A from reflectances. Um, uh, so one of the questions, well, we actually have two questions um, related to that is um, we've talked in recent lectures during this training course, we've talked a lot about atmospheric correction. Um, and this is something that you did not show in this notebook, but people were interested whether you could use Julia to do atmospheric correction and how you would go about doing that. Um, so yes, you could use Julia for that. Um, you will find some examples, um, not for ocean color, but for SAR uh, in the Julia AO um, setup notebooks that I pointed to. There was a link in the, in the, in the presentation. Um, and I think in general, it's going to be about you know, acquiring different variables in the satellite, acquiring environmental variables, maybe from randomnesses and other things, and then applying certain functions to the two to combine them and subtract different components. So all of that is is well supported and, and would be straightforward to do. Um, then somebody needs to do it, right? So yeah. I don't know that anybody has really implemented um, that workflow of corrections for um, the ocean color data set in July yet. Um, but I think it would be a very useful thing to do potentially. Um, and a pretty efficient thing to do ultimately because if you have those um, workflows in a reproducible open language, uh, whether that's Python or MATLAB, you should be able to transcode that pretty quickly to Julia. Mm -hmm. And then Julia comes with real performance benefits because it is compound. That's something I did not emphasize much today, um, but typically you can process very large data sets very fast. Um, and so, you know, that's a, I think that would be a very good idea to try and tackle that in Julia. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I was going to add that, um, of course, um, atmospheric correction uh, packages such as Polymer or Acolyte are available in Python. So you could use that interface between Python and Julia to run that through Julia. But what you're saying is it would be great if someone would develop those packages for Julia as well, um, because it potentially is much quicker um, to do the atmospheric correction on large data sets. Um, so thanks for that answer. Um, there were some specific questions about the notebook um, that you showed. Um, uh, there were questions about the spatial resolution of the CCI data that you've used um, and whether the wide wavelengths only go to 670. Um, so I think this might be related to um, the CCI data that was available at the time that you used. Um, so my guess it would be four kilometer spatial resolution. Um, and I think you might have only read in the wavelengths that you used for the algorithms that you then used in the notebook. But that's my guess. No, I think that I think that would be my guess as well. I should okay. say Tom Jackson is the person who actually I know he's unfortunately there. not here today. Um, mm -hmm. So you would know for sure, uh, but yeah. yes, I believe you're right. I think it's four okay. kilometers, and, and these are the yeah. words that were in the, uh, in the yeah. three or four. Yeah, Shuba, Shuba, do you want to add anything? Sorry, um, the question was why we don't have the infrared? Yeah, so why it wasn't included in uh, Gail's notebook? Well, the I mean, the data is, is there. The infrared is typically used for the atmospheric correction in the mm -hmm. algorithms. For the open ocean, yeah, that's the reason they're not in. Okay. Um, and then there was another question about the CCI data, um, whether um, that's also available for case two waters, um, and the answer is yes. Um, so the OC CCI product is available um, globally. Um, we've covered the 
OCCCI data in some of the yeah. previous lectures. We um, have, but with respect to the case one, case two waters, mm. I should like to add that um, the uncertainty increases in case two waters. Yeah. Um, because the algorithm performance is known to improve in the so called case one waters. Yeah. But the advantage of um, the CCI products, if you want to use them in case two waters, is that you do get some estimates of uncertainties. And you will see that even though we provide uncertainties, they do increase in case two waters. The mm -hmm. other advantage is that um, the CCI algorithm uses a suite of uh, algorithms again that are optimized for different optical classes. So when you move towards coastal waters, CCI will move towards algorithms that are designed for those waters, mm -hmm. which helps to reduce the uncertainties quite a lot. But you, you will still find that the uncertainties are higher typically when you move towards case two waters, but they are there. Thank you, Shuba. Um, there was a very specific question about your notebook uh, of the classification of ocean color data. I think someone struggled uh, with reading in a NetCDF file, um, so they got an error while reading in a file. Um, not sure if we can help with that at this point. Um, but the error that appeared um, has something to do with the location of the NetCDF file. So please, um, Thomas, um, who asked the question, please check what the data that you're reading in is actually at that location. So, it, yeah, and it is possible that that's my fault. Uh, because okay. in preparing the notebooks yesterday, I think I, I forgot to move the file in the right okay. place. Well. Um, so I'm going to say, you know, check in again tomorrow. Uh, we'll fix that if that's the one I'm thinking about. Um, if not, and if in fact there are any issues with the notebooks, um, you always have the option of one, opening an issue on the GitHub repositories, if you know how to do that, or you can also send me an email, um, but then you know the, the other people don't benefit. So GitHub is kind of better, but you can also send me an email. That's great, thank you, Gail. And Thomas says thank you as well. Um, we have a couple of more questions. You showed um, reading in different types of data. Um, so NetCDF files, I saw CSV text files. Um, there was a question about whether we could read in um, hyperspectral data. Um, so for example, the Prisma satellite, uh, the data format is HDF uh, five. Um, so, are you able to use that in Julia? Um, there's some yeah. things following up on that, but I'll come back to that. So, let's answer this first. So, yes, absolutely. There's, a, uh, I think there's a HDF five gel package, and I'm wondering whether even the NetCDF libraries can can just read that. Um, and I was going to mention, you know, other other formats as well. So, like something like ZAR, which is um, one of the sort of the newer uh, file formats, is also supported already. Um, and my experience has been that every time I've wanted to open a certain type of file, I have found a package that does it in Julia. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, following up on this question, um, have you any experience with pros uh, or working with hyperspectral data in Julia? Um, that's, for example, atmospheric correction or applying chlorophyll A algorithms. Um, so maybe you can comment on that. Um, I have not done that myself. Uh, you know, I realize I rely on my colleagues from PMN and, and elsewhere for this part. I have to say. Um, and uh, I guess maybe you, you're better, um, you could better answer this question, I'm sure. 
Well, I think it was a question from us because we're interested in it. But uh, Lauren, I think you might have to do this yourself and you can tell us later how you get on. Yes, I'm um, very keen to try it. Um, I've had a lot of trouble with, for example, hyperspectral data from PRISMA with the HDSR format. It's been a bit tricky. And so I'm interested to see if Julia is a bit more agile for dealing with these sorts of data. I was hoping you already had code available. You were like, yes, here's my GitHub. Go and download it and everything will work. But uh, uh, thank you. I'm looking forward to trying this. Awesome. Um, there's a question from me, actually. Um, so you've shown really useful examples um, through the notebooks um, for EO analysis and EO data processing. Um, so what would participants be able to do now? So where do they go from your notebook um, to doing their own things um, in Julia. Right. Um, well, maybe just stepping back one, one tiny bit on this. Um, I think the best way to approach Julia in a way is to find a little project that you wanted to do that you haven't can kind of gotten started um, and trying to do it in Julia instead of another language, uh, as opposed to something where you know, you would want to take all of your software in one language and try to translate it, right? So my my broad uh, comment on, you know, how to get started with Julia is kind of start with something small on the side, see if you like it, um, and then and then kind of go from there. Uh, and so, for example, um, you can take one of those notebooks that I've presented, and it will give you a, you know, a first view in some of the data that you may be interested in, a few examples of building blocks um, like reading a file plotting an array things like that um, and then you know these are kind of pieces you can reuse um, i like personally and i think most people do uh, to start from something that works so that's kind of the goal to provide you with notebooks that work and um, that's partly why i was emphasizing the environment um, coming with it um, and the last last element of that answer is is uh, maybe um, you know, you start by creating your own notebook that is related to something more specific you want to do. Um, maybe we use pieces from elsewhere, but creating a notebook and putting it online um, is a very good way to start. Um, once you want to go further, um, you know, you may want to see some new functionalities, for example, that are missing in, in the in the environment that you have in the software that, that are available. And so you you know a good way to to um, to be really useful and, and to do something um, that would be a good learning experience is to try to contribute to somebody else's software. And so there are mechanisms for this on, on GitHub in particular. Um, I'm not sure that the series of training will really cover GitHub in detail, but I would say that that's a really, really important tool for people with open science. Um, it's a very well um, developed and, and maintained um, software and website. In fact, it's been bought uh, by Microsoft some years ago for something like $10 billion because it's so valuable. Um, that also means they support it well. So GitHub is a good place to go. Um, and that's how you will be able to contribute to other people's software. And that will how you will be able to share your own software. Um, yeah. So there are also other ways to get in touch with people uh, that might be, um, you know, um, a useful way to get going. Uh, so the Slack channels um, that Julia has uh, is very widely used. Uh, if you have a question, you go there and you ask your question and then pretty convinced that quickly you'll get an answer. Um, so that's a good way to get involved and to, you know, get a sense of things that have been done and things that exist. Um, that you might not be aware of, and find you know, find some of the tools that you might need that were not in my notebooks, for example. Um, so that's already a fairly long answer, but I would <laughs> I would also highlight the collection of notebooks from the Julia AO um, uh, effort um, because there's a lot there that I did not cover, and and you might find rather useful. Thank you, Gail. Um, that's really helpful answer. Um, there's 
I was going to wrap up, but there is there is a question coming in also about reading in data, um, different types of data, I think. Um, so are there packages available to read in FCS and .c6 files um, in Julia? I must admit that I do not know what they are, so. I don't I know either. Mon I Monica my answer from before, but probably is a yeah. package that does it, but I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Um, Monica, I think you'll have to discover by yourself um, whether this is possible in Julia. Um, there were lots of questions about people asking for links and resources. Um, so I tried to put those in the chat while you were talking and people were asking. Um, I've put uh, the link to your presentation in the chat, uh, to your slides, um, and then that will give access to all of the links, all of the things you have shared today. Um, the video uh, recording will also be a lot online uh, probably next week or the week after so people can revisit your presentation um, and our Q&A um, about your presentation. Um, if there are no other questions um, from the panel, then um, I would like to wrap up um, this session for today. And thank you very much, Gail, for your lecture um, and for answering all of these questions. Well, Absolutely, thank you. Thank you very much for having me and giving me the opportunity to do this and for everybody in the audience for listening to this. And, you know, hopefully uh, we're going to have um, fun with Julia and, and also observation in the future. So thank you all. Thank you very much, uh, very useful. Thank you very much, um, Gail. There are lots of thank yous coming in. Excellence in the chat. If you're if you're not reading, it's always nice to read.